He was an heir to a fortune, but his mother held the purse strings. I don't think he bought groceries without just signing mommy's name. Stephen Benson wanted to make it big on his own. He felt the only thing that would make him happy is if he were a millionaire by the time he was 30. Only one person stood in his way. He was going to strike while the iron was hot, and he would be the one who inherited the entire state. A sordid tale of wealth, deceit, and a family torn apart by money. Tonight on Power, Privilege, and Justice. Naples, Florida, an exclusive resort town on the state's west coast, boasted the most millionaires per capita in America. It was a place that prided itself on its excellent fishing, golfing, and most of all, a sense of peace and quiet. At 9.18 on the morning of July 9th, Wealthy tobacco heiress Margaret Benson was getting ready to go on a drive with her three children. Her house was located in Quail Creek, an exclusive gated community built around two golf courses. Suddenly, the silence on the golf course was shattered by an enormous blast. A black cloud of smoke rose from the Benson driveway. The Benson Chevy Suburban was engulfed in flames. Within moments, a second blast erupted from the vehicle. Paramedics and police detectives swarmed to the area and were immediately taken aback by the scene. And as I looked at the vehicle, the, the first thing we thought was either this is a murder or these people have a heck of a case against General Motors, you know, because we incredible destruction. It just looked like it took a beer can and just peeled it apart and left it in the open, jagged edges. That's what you had for a Suburban, 1978 Suburban. We could see that the metal was blasted downward toward the ground in, in both instances, and they were sizable craters. And we theorized that there had been two separate bombs in the vehicle. Margaret Benson and her 21-year-old son, Scott, lay on opposite sides of the car. Carol Lynn, Margaret's middle-aged daughter, was lying on the grass nearby, moaning. She was out on the ground, and she tore her blouse off, and she was being burned. Carol Lynn had third-degree burns on 30% of her body and was taken immediately to the hospital. Once I found that there'd been some type of explosive device detonated, then I'm thinking, in this neighborhood, who are these people, and why is this happening? The investigation into the bombing would lead authorities into the private world of a wealthy and, as it turns out, very dysfunctional tobacco family. As the evidence mounted, a tragic picture began to emerge. It told the story of a forgotten son, a dark family secret, and a murder so ruthless it would make the investigators shudder. As bomb experts sifted through the debris in the front yard, detectives entered the house. Inside, they found Stephen Benson, Margaret's older son. Stephen hadn't been in the car, and the detectives thought he seemed strangely unaffected by the disaster. I would have been screaming and yelling for the person who did this. I would have demanded to go with the ambulance with my sister to the hospital. Stephen, he did none of those things. The detectives had the car taken away and they reconvened at the sheriff's office to compare notes about what they'd seen at the house. It was more or less like, you know, something's not right here. We've got at least a place to start. Now, all homicides, everyone's a suspect until you eliminate. So let's go with the most obvious. Stephen Benson's family had made their money 1,000 miles north in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. His grandfather, Harry Hitchcock, rose from poverty to make a fortune. His company, Lancaster Leaf, was one of the largest dealers of tobacco in the world. 
But Hitchcock was a religious man, and money meant little to him. Hitchcock's daughter Margaret married Edward Benny Benson, a sharp businessman like her father. And in 1945, Benny moved right into the family business. They had a daughter, Carol Lynn, and seven years later, a son, Stephen. As they grew up, Benny was often away from home on business. Apparently, he was a very strict father and not a particularly warm one from all that I've heard. Uh, he was on the road a lot, and he didn't seem to be paying as much attention to what was happening at home as he did to the company business. In Lancaster, the Bentons spent lavishly. They had a 17-room house, an Olympic-sized swimming pool, and 14-carat gold bathroom fixtures. Summers were spent at the Beach House in New Jersey, winters at a ski chalet in Canada. They bought toys, clothes, mini bikes, and snowmobiles, and a warehouse to store it all. Their behavior was not what Lancaster society was used to. You had a, a pattern of very conspicuous consumption in the small Pennsylvania town. Benny and Margaret gave Carolyn and Stephen everything they wanted but it was made clear that it could all be taken away if they didn't do as their parents wished. It's a very complex way they showed their love. It was, uh, if you're good, we, we will help you. If you're bad, we punish you. Carolyn proved to be a beauty, with hair bleached blonde to match her mother's. Margaret spared no expense on her daughter, encouraging her at an early age to model and compete in beauty contests. And she was overjoyed when her daughter was runner-up in the 1966 Miss New Jersey pageant. Meanwhile, Stephen tried to be a good son and meet his parents' expectations. I think he was a lonely, seemingly more sensitive, certainly more introverted character than his sister. And I think Stephen very much took the back seat in that family. Stephen had a knack for electronics, and he spent hours alone in the basement, building homemade radios and television sets. When Stephen was 13, Carol Lynn went off to college, and it was finally his chance to get his parents' full attention. But his time in the spotlight was cut short. Margaret announced that she was adopting a baby boy named Scott. But the story that went around in Lancaster was quite different. I think most people locally knew already that, that it was Carolyn's uh, child, that the parents had insisted that she not put it up for adoption, but rather be raised by Margaret and Benny. There were many people who felt this was a, a typical sort of Benson uh, move. It was a, a sort of manipulative and punitive gesture on the part of the parents, a sort of constant reminder to Carolyn of a mistake that she had made as a teenager. Benny and Margaret doted on the new baby. Once again, Stephen, the quiet, good son, was left out. As he got older, Stephen was determined to prove to his parents that he could be a success at business too. But he had neither his grandfather's ability nor his father's drive. Stephen just couldn't seem to get anything right. Poor guy. Once he and his father went turkey hunting, Stephen brought down a bird and came back to his father, brimming with excitement about his prize. His father looked at him and frowned. Stephen had bagged a peacock. Stephen majored in business in college, but he dropped out three times. He borrowed thousands of dollars from his parents to start up a landscaping business, but it went belly up. He went into one business right after the other and they backed him every time and they got him out of debt. And the thing is, he was not an achiever. He would start something, but he wouldn't finish it. Benny, he was very disappointed in Stephen. He didn't think Stephen really had a backbone. When Stephen married at age 21, his parents bought the newlyweds a house right across the street. It and everything else the young couple had was in his parents' name. His wife resented the way his parents controlled him, and after six years, they divorced. Meanwhile, Stephen's adopted brother Scott was growing up to be everything Stephen wasn't. Scott was handsome and outgoing, witty and athletic. He was even beginning to show promise as a tennis player. In 1980, Benny and Margaret decided to retire to exclusive Naples, Florida. Stephen had remarried and Benny had given him a low-level job in the hopes that someday Stephen would take over the Lancaster Leaf Empire. 
but Stephen still had dreams of creating an empire of his own. Golly, Pete, Benny would have loved for Stephen to come and say, hey, Dad, I'm going to help you out in this business, and, and I'm going to work, and I'll do it your way. But he couldn't do that. He just couldn't do it. Then it was too late. In 1980, Benny Benson was told he had lung cancer. Benny had always been the one who controlled the family fortune, doling out money to Margaret and the children. When Benny was alive, he handled everything. Usually she didn't even have her purse. I said, where are your pocketbook? Oh, I, I don't have it. I, you have to have it to have a driver's license. Oh, no, I don't have it. They just did not have the respect for the money. Six weeks later, Benny was dead, and Margaret was left with a $10 million fortune. She began to look to Stephen for help in managing the money. In exchange, Stephen hoped he would get control of the money and make his dream of being a successful businessman a reality. But Stephen was in for another disappointment. Margaret had no intention of giving up control of her money or her son. Stephen had spent his life under his mother's thumb and he'd do anything to get out from under it. Tobacco heiress Margaret Benson and her son Scott had been killed when their car exploded in the driveway of their posh Naples, Florida home. Margaret's daughter Carolyn clung to life and was rushed to a burn hospital in Boston. The only member of the Benson family left unhurt in the blast was Stephen, Margaret's 34-year-old son. And Stephen was refusing to cooperate with investigators. I called Stephen up. Stephen said that on advice of counsel that he was not going to speak with us at all. People behave in all kinds of strange ways after a trauma. The police know this and are careful not to interpret everything as guilt. But some behaviors are stranger than others. And Stephen Benson was acting just plain weird. In the days following the murders, detectives noticed Stephen driving around Naples in his white van, which had been splattered with blood in the explosion. One of my sergeants called me early one morning and he said, we're on the move. It appears that Stephen was taking mother for a ride again. What was he talking about? His mother was dead. It was because he never washed that van, never. The detectives grew even more suspicious of Stephen after talking to Wayne Kerr, Margaret's accountant, who had been working at the house the morning of the explosions. I think the police are doing everything they can do at this point. Margaret had hired Kerr at Stephen's suggestion four years earlier to help her manage her finances. She was sitting on a $10 million fortune and was running through it at an alarming rate. After her husband's death, went down to Florida and began spending money in ways that simply beggar the imagination. Ten cars and five houses. Margaret had just bought a half million dollar house in Naples and was planning to build another twice as big. She bought two new yachts and was having a cigarette boat custom built. Plus, she was still supporting her three grown children. Margaret's daughter, Carolyn, was 37 and divorced with two sons. Carolyn wanted to be a Hollywood producer. Margaret was paying for film school and had bought her a condo. Scott had dreams of being a world-class tennis player, and Margaret supported him to the tune of $7,000 a month. Every member of the family wanted to be perceived as people who had a purpose and were being productive. It might have been wiser for somebody to actually get a job, um, you know, even if it was uh, flipping burgers or something, but that's something that nobody ever got around to doing. But it was Stephen who was draining his mother's accounts most of all. He had uprooted his second wife and their three kids and moved from Lancaster to Florida. He thought Naples might be the place where he would finally make his fortune. Stephen's latest business venture was a home security company called Meridian that installed alarm systems in the wealthy homes of Naples. Margaret was providing all the startup money and paying Stephen's salary. Stephen envisioned Meridian as the beginning of a corporate empire, even though their offices consisted of little more than a trailer. There were 10 or 12 different corporations that had Meridian in the title. Meridian Security, Meridian this, Meridian that. I mean, we're talking about opening a lemonade stand in your backyard and hoping that it grows into a beverage corporation. 
Stephen didn't have the push, the drive. You start on the bottom and you go up. And apparently Stephen always wanted to start at the top and you only fall down. Then in early 1985, while preparing her taxes, Margaret's accountant, Wayne Kerr, told Margaret she had spent $1.5 million in one year. At that rate, she would be broke in seven years. Margaret panicked. She began to stay up late at night, writing down every penny she had given her children. She worried that her money was disappearing right before her eyes. Mrs. Benson, I really don't think that she was that knowledgeable about what was going on, but she began to take a more active interest in it when she found out that she was quickly running out of money. Margaret was also preoccupied with her adopted son, Scott. He had grown into a wild teenager who threw temper tantrums and did drugs. Became the kind of kid who wrecked cars and drove trucks into ponds, who actually had a scuba tank to sniff nitrous oxide in industrial quantities. Kid who smoked a lot of dope, did some cocaine, and hung out with other people who did. He became you know, the typical rich kid running naked through the streets with his hair on fire. Scott was so out of control, Margaret had him arrested and put into a psychiatric ward, but not before she put his violent threats on tape. Just because it's your house doesn't mean you do what you want with my dog. Can you understand that, Steve? Stephen, always the peacemaker, was called on to intervene. He was, by comparison to the other people, the reasonable one. He's the person who quieted Scott down his mother depended on or to give advice. This doesn't mean that he wasn't himself taking advantage of her. Stephen was getting check after check from his mother for his company, Meridian Security. But what he wasn't telling her was that most of it was going into a new company he had created in Fort Myers, 30 miles away. It was called Meridian Marketing, and it was going to be all his own. But in early 1985, Margaret's accountant, Wayne Kerr, found out about Stephen's secret company. When Margaret asked Stephen about Meridian Marketing, he denied that it existed. Margaret believed him and dropped the subject. She was busy prepping for a trip to Europe with Scott. But before she left for Europe, Stephen called. Meridian was strapped for cash, and he wasn't going to be able to make the payroll. He needed her to sign two checks to Meridian and he wanted the amounts left blank. His mother signed the checks. The way they did business was perfectly represented by the fact that she supposedly is angry at him for spending a lot of money, but then when she goes away to Europe, she leaves two blank checks with him. I mean, he had been doing things like this for his entire adult life. Stephen made the checks out for $10,000 and $50,000 and deposited them in the Meridian account. Then he wrote a check for a down payment on a new house for himself in Fort Myers. Margaret heard about the house from Wayne Kerr while she was in Europe. Boy, Margaret just had a fit over that. I said, well, Margaret, he, he'll have to pay for it. She said, how is he going to pay for it? Margaret cut her trip short and arranged to meet Wayne Kerr in Naples. And Wayne Kerr, he got through telling them the reason he'd be, been brought down to Naples. We felt strongly that Stephen had a motive. Stephen was at work when he got the news that his mother would be coming back early. Employees at Meridian saw him go into his office and close the door. They said they could hear the sounds of Stephen hyperventilating. Stephen had spent his whole life being the good son, the one who tried to please his parents, the Benson who never got into trouble. But Stephen was in trouble now, and he would do anything to get out of it. On Monday, July 8, 1985, Wayne Kerr and Margaret went to the Meridian offices to ask Stephen where he got the money to buy the house. Stephen told his mother he had sold his car, a Datsun 280ZX. Margaret drove to Fort Myers with Wayne Kerr to see Stephen's new house for herself. And when his mother went up there, she saw the Datsun 280Z and realized that no, Stephen was continuing not to be truthful with her. She was very upset and that she was thinking about adjusting Stephen's financial picture drastically. Margaret had had enough. She told Stephen that Wayne Kerr would come back to his office the next day to go through Stephen's books. Stephen didn't seem to care. He had all of his life been given money by mother 
and taken back by mother. He never owned his own home, he never owned his own car, he never, I, I, don't, I don't think he bought groceries without just signing mommy's name. All of a sudden, here it comes one more time, and here she's coming to do it again. And I think, very possibly, that Stephen just said enough. The explosion that killed millionaire Margaret Benson and her son Scott had left debris all over their posh Florida neighborhood. The explosion was so huge that the detectives were picking pieces of the suburban out of screen doors three mansions away. Trying to piece together the bomb was an enormous undertaking, but it was their best shot at nailing the killer. After several days of picking up the shrapnel from the Suburban, investigators had what they were looking for. Miraculously, they were able to find enough pieces of pipe to put it together almost like a jigsaw puzzle and determine that the device was 12 inches long and it was four inches in diameter. They had the makings of two pipe bombs, weighing an estimated 26 pounds. They also found shards of circuit boards and batteries in the debris, which gave them an idea of how the bombs could have been detonated. By this time, we were told that it wasn't hooked to the ignition, that it was some kind of electronic device that set it off. Get the memorial service for Margaret and Scott Benson. The detectives would receive their big break. Stephen let something slip. He told one of the mourners that when he was a kid back in Lancaster, he had made explosives as a hobby. If Stephen Benson had something to hide, he was really doing a poor job. The cops were already suspicious, and now with the news that Stephen was into explosives, well. So here we got a guy that can, knows electronics and also built pipe bombs with his buddies in high school. We started to get more and more information that was tending to look right at Stephen Wayne Benson. And every time, our investigation took us away, it came right back. Then, two weeks after the murder, investigators got word that the only eyewitness to the explosion was ready to talk to them from her hospital bed in Boston. Stephen Benson's sister, Carol Lynn, had suffered third degree burns and remained in critical condition. The burning flesh just, I, I was almost nauseated kind of threw me back a little, but we both kind of looked at each other and said, you know, we, we, we got to go to work here. With the detectives in her room in the intensive care unit, Carol Lynn began to tell the story of the day before the murders. Carol Lynn was visiting from Boston, helping her mother with the plans for her new property. She was at her mother's house when Margaret returned from confronting Stephen at Meridian. Margaret knew about Stephen's new house and his secret business, and she was furious. These things combined to cause Margaret to become very, very resolute that she was going to uh, change Stephen's financial picture. Carolyn told the detectives that that night, Stephen called and suggested that they all meet up the next morning. She says that he called and he wanted to go and help stake out the new property, and which is not something that he, like, normally would be wanting to do. He wanted everybody to be ready to go and everyone to get be up. The next morning, Carol Lynn and her mother were sitting at the kitchen table with Wayne Kerr when Stephen arrived at the house in his white company van. He came into the house, went in and asked if they had coffee and did any of them want any and donuts, and he'd go get them. And then he, he left the house. But Carol Lynn said Stephen took the family suburban, not the van he arrived in. The minutes started to tick by. Stephen said he was going to a convenience store just a half mile away. He was taking his time. Stephen returned almost an hour later. Margaret, Carol Lynn, and Scott were waiting. They all walked out of the house toward the car. Stephen sat everybody in the vehicle that morning. He put mom in the passenger side asked Scott to drive where Stephen would normally drive, being the older brother, and put Caroline right on top of the bomb in the back seat. As Carolyn climbed into the car, Stephen was walking around the back. He handed the keys to Scott and then said he'd forgotten something in the house. So he heads back to the house and then the next thing Carolyn says, she hears a clicking noise and she said then there was this 
huge explosion. And all she knew was that there was a burning sensation and this orange fireball coming at her. She said she doesn't know how, but she got herself out of the vehicle and she was rolling around on the ground trying to smother out the fire. And she looked up and she saw Stephen standing somewhere in front of the truck now. She looked at Stephen and he looked at her and she said he ran back in the house. Then a second bomb went off and Carolyn blacked out completely. She remembered nothing more. Her voice was so soft and uh, there was so much pain in it. And we had to be careful because we caught ourselves being caught up in the emotion with her. That's a lot of trauma coming in on anybody and with the mental anguish she was in, she did not want it to be her brother. The detectives knew that Carolyn's memory of that morning could cement the case against Stephen Benson. They also knew that she was lying about her brother, Scott, and that could destroy her credibility if she didn't come clean. Throughout our interview, she referred to Scott as her brother. Mike Coors had been interviewing people in Lancaster who said that the rumor was that Scott was really Carolyn's son, not her brother. She was quite surprised when, we, when it was brought to her attention. She was quite surprised that we were aware. And uh, w when she said, yes, Scott's my son, uh, it was almost uh, sad when she said it. She could have denied it. She could have denied it and fought it with us. She didn't. That places a high emphasis to us as law enforcement officers that that was a difficult truth. If she could look at us and say yes, it only supported that everything else she was saying to us, she was giving us the truth. Carol Lynn's amazing admission to investigators about Scott gave her credibility. And the story she told them about what happened the morning of the explosion put Stephen Benson squarely in their sights. But the police didn't bargain on just how difficult it would be to arrest him. Three weeks after the murder of tobacco heiress Margaret Benson, her son Stephen Benson had emerged as the primary suspect. Investigators had pieced together two pipe bombs from the debris in the driveway. Their next objective was just as difficult. They had to somehow link the bomb parts to Stephen. The investigators figured they would have to talk to every store clerk in Florida who had sold a specific kind of pipe. It seemed like an impossible task, but as it turned out, they didn't have to look very far at all. And I remember we went to like use supply where we did actually find something eventually. And I wrote in my notes, yes, they sold a 12 inch pipe, four inch diameter. Hughes Supply was located around the corner from Stephen's office. A clerk remembered selling four galvanized metal end caps to a man in a baseball cap and glasses on Friday, July 5th, four days before the murders. We interviewed a couple of employees at Meridian Security Company, and they had never known Stephen to ever wear a hat, ever. But either on Thursday or Friday, they couldn't remember which, Stephen was trying to find a ball cap. The clerk said that the day before the murder, the same man also purchased two metal pipes, and there was more potential evidence at the store. We found an invoice, and that contained a left-handed writer's palm, and we knew Stephen was left-handed. There were palm prints on the invoice, but Stephen Benson's prints were not on file. Stephen had hired a lawyer named Mike McDonald. McDonald wasn't about to let the police anywhere near his client. They asked us if uh, Stephen would give his palm prints, and we said no. Uh, get a warrant if you can. The Collier County investigators set a legal precedent. They wrote a search warrant for Stephen's fingerprints, the first of its kind. When they arrived at his lawyer's office to take his palm prints, Stephen was calm. Lieutenant Jack Gant took the prints, and I asked Lieutenant Gant what he thought, and he said, well, he's either a cold-blooded killer or totally innocent. He says, because I fingerprint applicants for school teaching jobs whose hands were shaking more than his were. His hands were as steady as a rock. 
Stephen's palm prints were immediately delivered to an ATF forensic expert. He laid them down side by side. He looked through a magnifying glass for an extended period of time. And then he said, come over here and look at this. And I did. And he said, what do you think? The prints were matching. Five days later, Stephen Benson was arrested at his lawyer's office in Fort Myers. I sat in the back seat with him, and she went to sleep. Never said a word. Just went to sleep in the back of the car. And I did think to myself, uh, one cold-blooded son of a bitch. Stephen was charged with two counts of first-degree murder and one count of attempted murder. The trial was ready to begin in July 1986. It received so much media attention that the trial had to be moved from Naples to Fort Myers, Florida. Kathy, the Stephen Benson murder trial got underway at about 10.30 this morning with jury selection. National media coverage has focused on Stephen Benson because he is accused of killing his mother. It was uh, an unusual trial. It was televised from start to finish. The courtroom was chock-a-block with writers and journalists. We'll have complete coverage throughout the day and up-to-date reports as the situation warrants. It was the biggest trial to ever hit South Florida, and quiet, introverted Stephen Benson was taking a supporting role at his own trial. The real stars were the lawyers. The defense and the prosecution who had contrasting styles. You had Mike McDonald, fluent, articulate, physically imposing, a bit flashy, he had a lovely wife, he drove a Jaguar. How would you describe all the pretrial publicity that this case has gotten? Pervasive. What do you mean? <laughs> In every way, he was the opposite of Jerry, Brock, and his brother Dwight. We feel extremely comfortable about the, uh, the quality of our case and the evidence. Prosecutors Jerry and Dwight Brock came across quite differently than McDonald. They would give you the sense that they were kind of country and rather slow. They can lull you into this comfort zone and then tear you literally apart. The press couldn't have asked for better characters. McDonald was flashy and the Brock brothers were folksy. Reporters called it Miami Vice meets the Beverly Hillbillies. As the trial approached, the Brock brothers were amassing shopping carts full of evidence against Stephen. But Mike McDonald was hoping to distract the jury with lurid stories about Stephen's younger brother, Scott. There was a good deal of information and evidence that he was heavily involved in drugs and perhaps the drug trade. This type of execution of people is consistent in Florida with uh, those who run afoul of their business associates in the drug trade. McDonald had lined up Scott's psychiatrist to testify, but he had been accused a year before of sexual harassment. McDonald also hired a jury selection expert, but it turned out she'd been arrested three years earlier for putting a hit on her boyfriend. Stephen's defense was going to be a good show. Amidst all the pretrial excitement, Stephen Benson remained quiet. Stephen Benson simply sat there. He was a black hole. He was uh, something around which everything else rotated. The only survivor of the explosion was out of the hospital and willing to testify. All of Fort Myers was hoping to catch a glimpse of the trial's star witness, Stephen's sister, Carol Lynn. The former beauty queen was now horribly scarred. But Carol Lynn was about to steal the spotlight once again from her younger brother, Stephen. Ken, uh, the highlights of today were opening arguments and the beginning of testimony. The trial has begun. This morning, Benson appeared to be crying in the courtroom at the end of opening arguments. I'd like to look at this man, my friend, Stephen Benson. Stephen had no one by his side. His wife, Debbie, had taken their three children and gone to live with her parents in Wisconsin. And his sister was a witness for the prosecution. Stephen was so alone in the courtroom, his lawyer, Mike McDonald, had his own mother-in-law come to court and chit-chat with Stephen in front of the jurors. The press dubbed her Rent-A-Mom. On the second day of the trial, the prosecution's star witness arrived. Stephen's sister, Carol Lynn. 
But I think she had a difficult time believing that Stephen could have done it. She didn't really didn't want to implicate her brother. The jury sat wrapped as Carol Lynn recounted the moments after the explosion. This was the first time she ever called Scott her son in public. I could, I could see my, my, the body of my son lying out on the ground. And I guess that seeing Scott's body and seeing the, the, the flames, it, shot, it kind of woke me up and, and I realized that the car was on fire and I had to get out. The next thing that I remember is seeing my brother Stephen standing on, on the walk. Do you recall what he was doing? He was just staring straight ahead. Okay, and what did you do after you became aware of his presence on the uh, wall? Couldn't understand why he wasn't coming over to help me. Throughout Carolyn's testimony, her chair was angled away from her brother toward the jury. Stephen stared at her with no emotion on his face. Over two weeks, Jerry Brock methodically showed the jury 162 pieces of evidence. He showed that Stephen had been slowly siphoning money from his mother's accounts, that he had the knowledge to build pipe bombs, and that he had purchased the elements needed to build the one that killed his family. Stephen's lawyer, Mike McDonald, tried to throw suspicion off his client by suggesting that it was the wild, rebellious son, Scott, not the quiet son, Stephen, who may have brought this tragedy on the family. I do not intend to speak ill of the dead, but the facts will be clear that Scotty was off in the wrong direction. There was turmoil in the family, and uh, uh, Stephen's role, as I uh, found it, was a peacemaker in the family. And so the charges against him were inconsistent with what he demonstrated in the past, whereas Others were fighting constantly and threatening and acting in dysfunctional and strange ways. He played the recording Margaret made of Scott's violent threats over a year before. Everybody that's around here knows that you call up my dog. Do you hear that, Mother? And you listen when I tell you to keep him the hell out of this house. Just because it's your house doesn't mean you do what you want with my dog. Can you understand that? Do you? Get her hands up. Then, McDonald called witnesses to the stand and tried to connect Scott's drug use to his murder. Scott had a bottle of nitric oxide, coke, and, and smoking some pot. How much did Scott Benson do? Inhaled one time, too. With all this cocaine, what was Scott doing with it? He was putting it in his nose. The only trouble was you could never put Scott with any major drug dealer. You could find Scott buying a bag of marijuana or buying some nitrous, but it always small quantities. You never heard of Scott buying something where you get whacked for it. I think the defense did the only thing they could do. The only thing they could do when your client is obviously guilty, you can use the sod defense that some other dude did it. I mean, the judge simply said that he's throwing at the wall to see what sticks. Judge Hugh Hayes was angry at the defense team for wasting the jury's time with hearsay about Stephen's brother, Scott. It's nothing but damn bush league. And in this kind of a trial, with this kind of stakes, in any kind of court, it's, it's irritating. Jerry Brock's closing argument was damning. There was the physical evidence, the palm prints, the invoice, and the bank statements. And then there was the vivid portrait Brock painted of Stephen's relationship with his mother. The spoiled, resentful son who killed to escape his mother's controlling grasp. I was sitting next to Carolyn as she listened to Jerry Brock detail all the evidence against Stephen. She asked me, she said, how did he ever hope to get away with it? All his life, Stephen Benson had been overshadowed and overlooked. Now he was at center stage and his audience of jurors was about to decide his fate. Toward the end of the trial, the patriarch of the Benson family, Stephen's grandfather, Harry Hitchcock, arrived from Lancaster, Pennsylvania. Harry Hitchcock must have been devastated. Like so many empire builders, 
He had come from nothing, created a fortune to leave to his children, and they squandered it. Observers in the courtroom that day said he never once looked at his grandson, Stephen. It took only a day for the jury to reach their conclusion. State of Florida versus Stephen Wayne Benson, verdict. The defendant is guilty as charged of first degree premeditated murder. Mrs. Foster, is this your verdict? Yes. When the guilty verdicts were read, Stephen reacted with a complete lack of emotion. And as he was let out of the court, the questions were shouted at him by the press and he didn't answer or even acknowledge. At the sentencing, the jury split over the death penalty. In all this time, Stephen has never spoken to the press. Only Stephen knows why he did it. I mean, really, why he did it. I spoke after the verdict to a member of the prosecution who, uh, who said that he didn't feel that the motive was financial. He felt it was, it was personal and psychological, that his mother was manipulative and controlling, and that he saw at this point in his life that he was never going to get out from under her thumb while she was alive. He therefore decided to kill, kill her and, and kill his sister and kill his brother. You know, one of the things that always struck me as absolutely reprehensible about this, Stephen had killed, uh, you know, the woman who gave birth to him. You know, looking at it from the standpoint of my values, that's just about as bad as you get. It, it hurts, it hurts. And I know good and well, uh, if Margaret was alive, and even if Margaret knew what has happened, I know in her heart, uh, to a certain extent, she would still have a lot of love for Stephen. In the end, Carolyn inherited the bulk of her mother's $10 million fortune. Stephen was left with nothing. He's a person who came from a very wealthy family, but this guy had so little money that after the trial, he couldn't even afford to have uh, a transcript of the trial typed up so that he could make an appeal. Benson family patriarch Harry Hitchcock died in Lancaster three years after the trial. Harry Hitchcock felt that his money corrupted his children and he felt very remorseful about that. And I think he ultimately made the decision that he would dispose of his money at his death uh, by giving it to some charitable organizations and give only a very limited amount to the family. Stephen Benson was sent to one of the toughest prisons in Florida, Rayford Penitentiary. Shortly after he arrived, he was attacked and stabbed in the throat by another inmate. Stephen survived, but he got the message. Boys who killed their mothers aren't thought of very highly behind bars. For Court TV, I'm Dominic Dunn.